The seamy details keep coming out in the Clarence Thomas corruption story. And it's the biggest story in politics. And we have the reporter who keeps bringing them to light. I'm Matt Robeson. This is Beyond Politics. We're on the Blue Amp channel on YouTube. And we're available, of course, wherever you get your podcasts. Justin Elliott is an award-winning reporter with ProPublica, where he covers business and politics. He was on the team of reporters documenting how the rich avoid taxes for the secret IRS files series. He's produced stories for outlets, including the New York Times, NPR. And his work has spurred congressional investigations and changes to federal legislation. We can cross our fingers. That is going to be the case in the story that he is reporting right now. He was part of the reporting team that broke the blockbuster story titled Clarence Thomas and the Billionaire last month. Now he's coming to us fresh off of reporting new details about more secretive money flowing from right-wing billionaire Harlan Crow to benefit Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas. Justin, welcome to Beyond Politics. Good to be here. I want to start off by saying thank you. What you're doing is what the media is supposed to do. You've contributed to something that's really important to the public's understanding. And it's so critical, especially in a democracy and at a time when journalists like Evan Gershkovich and Austin Tice are held hostage around the world for doing the exact same thing. I just want to start by acknowledging the importance of the work you're doing. So thank you. It doesn't get said enough. Yeah, we appreciate it. Yeah, I'm a part of a team of three, Josh Kaplan, Alex Meyer, Jeske, and we're We've actually only been at this for four or five months, and we're reporting on the entire Supreme Court. So far, it's been focused on Justice Thomas, but we appreciate that. It it deserves to be said. And just quickly, for anyone who hasn't read the story that you published yesterday with those new revelations about these previously hidden tuition payments, I urge people to check it out on ProPublica. Could you tell us that story of what happened here? Sure, yeah. And to recap just briefly the previous stories, so we, we had established, um, and this was building off some earlier reporting by others like 10 or 15 years ago, but we established, sorry, let me say that again, we, we reported on the extremely unusual financial ties between Harlan Crow, who's this real estate billionaire based out of Tal Dallas, also a major political donor, and Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas. The first story was about how Crow has been taking Justice Thomas on these incredibly lavish vacations for more than two decades involving his private jet and his super yacht, globetrotting vacations that could cost hundreds of thousands of dollars if Justice Thomas were paying for them himself. The second story was about the fact that Crow had actually purchased some real estate down in Savannah, Georgia, from Justice Thomas and his relatives. Several unusual things about that, one of which probably the most unusual thing is that Harlan Crow now owns the house where Justice Thomas's elderly mother currently lives. And apparently he's her landlord, except the term may not really be correct here because he apparently does not charge her rent. And originally after the first story, both Crow and Justice Thomas said, look, we're very close friends and it's normal for friends to travel together. The latest story really adds a sort of even more unusual dimension to this friendship or what they describe as a friendship, which is that Crow paid private boarding school tuition for Justice Thomas's grand nephew. And grand nephew is somewhat misleading because it understates their relationship because Justice Thomas and Jenny Thomas back in the late 1990s actually took legal custody of their grandnephew and became his legal guardians when he was just six years old and then raised him as their son in the D.C. suburbs between the ages of six and 18 or 18 or 19. So this is essentially their son and Crow paid for boarding school tuition at two different schools. We don't have the exact amount of money, but we believe now is at least around $100,000. And the other aspect to this story and actually all the stories is that Justice Thomas hasn't disclosed any of what we've written about, and many ethics lawyers we've spoken to say their interpretation of the law is that much of what we've written about should have been disclosed as gifts on the justices' annual financial disclosure. So I guess to sum it up, you have extremely unusual financial relationship between a billionaire political donor and a Supreme Court justice, all of it happening in secret, or at the very least, in a way it's not being disclosed as it should be. This is, to quote Top Gun, a target-rich environment. I, I have so many questions here, as I think America does. 
I want to start by taking that step back that you did to that original and quite sensational story. I mean that in the best possible sense of that word. Without giving away any of your trade secrets, could you tell us where did that story start? Was there something that brought this situation with Thomas and Crow to your attention that led to that deeper investigation? Because as you say, there were aspects of this that were hiding in plain sight for a long time, but your team were the ones that went ahead and did the work. Yeah, it's really interesting reporting on the Supreme Court, which we've only been doing since maybe December. So it's a new beat to me, but I spent a lot of years covering, writing about Congress and the executive branch, writing about kind of ethics issues under both Democratic, about both Democrats and Republicans. Actually, one of my first stories at ProPublica was, which was 10 or 11 years ago, was about a Democratic congressman in upstate New York violating the rules actually on, on accepting foreign travel. This was Bill Owens led to him being getting in trouble with the Ethics Committee. When you're doing that work as a reporter about Congress, for example, or especially about the executive branch, the bread and butter of that work are public records. You can get the public calendar of the Treasury Secretary or another Cabinet Secretary. We have a whole lobbying disclosure regime. We have campaign finance disclosure. You can get visitor logs sometimes for different federal agencies or the White House, or at least the White House before the Trump administration. And usually you don't just find a story in those records, but those records are the basis for a lot of reporting that you can then go out and talk to people. One of the interesting things that you realize pretty quickly when you're reporting on the Supreme Court is that literally none of that exists. There, there's no public calendars for the justices. If you want to file a Freedom of Information request to get records, it turns out you can't because the Freedom of Information Act doesn't apply the, to the judiciary. If you go to the Supreme Court website, you'll find a calendar, but it's just a calendar of when the court is in session. And so we got interested in this travel issue in part because we were just doing some reading and we were reading about the circumstances in which Justice Scalia died back mm. in 2016, um, which as many people listening probably remember, Justice Scalia passed away at a hunting ranch in Texas. And there were some stories done after that about the sort of circumstances of this trip. There was like a private jet involved. There were some interesting people, people of influence, potential influence who were on that trip. So we got interested in the travel issue and we ended up looking at some records from the U.S. Marshals, which provide security for the Supreme Court, although are not part of the judiciary. So you actually can get records from the marshals, although they're highly redacted. And we were able to cross-reference some of what we found in those U.S. Marshals records with some other material that we had. And we initially found a single trip that Justice Thomas had taken with Harlan Crow or had taken on Harlan Crow's private jet. And we decided, okay, this seems pretty interesting. Let's dig into it. And at that point, because there's so few public records when it comes to the court, it was really a lot of just talking to people. And so talk, as we described in the story, talking to service workers, like people that worked on Harlan Crow's very large yacht to, to document. In many ways, actually, that story was an exercise in creating a calendar that doesn't exist publicly for Justice mm -hmm. Thomas. So that was, that was part of the process on that one. It really does sound like what you might see in the movie or read the book, All the President's Men. It's old-fashioned shoe leather reporting. I, just as a follow-up on this, was there something that tipped you off to this incredibly obscure tuition situation? That's When you read the story, it really does seem to be buried, and you had to unearth it. Yeah, I don't want to go into the full circumstances on that one, but what I can say is that the, one of the schools that Justice Thomas's relative, whose name is Mark Martin, who he raised as a son, one of the schools he went to, boarding schools, was a school down in Georgia called Hidden Lake Academy, and it that's a little out, on the nose, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I actually hadn't thought of that, but it turned out this school, just totally unrelated to this situation had a bankruptcy case and had it, it no longer exists. And my my reporting partner, Josh Kaplan and I, when we were reporting on this, um, we're trying to understand more about the school and we started reading the bankruptcy case. 
And it turns out in these chapter 11 cases, the what they call, I, I believe the legal term is like the debtor in possession has to file uh, sort of financial updates with the court in order to get approval for paying salaries and that sort of thing while it's going through the bankruptcy process. And just by, by chance, there was a bank statement for the school in those bankruptcy filings that contained this record of a wire payment from Harlan Crow's company, Crow Holdings, to the school for a month of tuition, which was running like $6,200 $6, for a month. It was a quite expensive school. And it's listed on the bank statement as a wire. And then it says Mark Martin, like for Mark Martin. And that's, that was the exact amount of the tuition for that month. We also spoke to an administrator at the school who's, who we quote on the record saying that this was Crow paid the entire tuition for the roughly year he was there. And after our story was published, Justice Thomas, who had not didn't comment before the story and actually didn't comment after the story either, but a longtime friend and associate of the Thomas family, Mark Pauletta, put out a statement confirming that this was accurate. Harlan Crow paid this tuition at, for at least one year at, at each at two different schools, which we still don't have the full numbers, but we're talking probably around $100,000. Just, it's very impressive. Just as an aside, I'm a huge fan of the biographer Robert Caro, who's written the Lyndon Johnson series. And he wrote a fascinating New Yorker article where he talked about his method. And the advice he got from his first editor was, when you're looking at records, read every damn page. And it does sound like, it's like that scene in All the President's Men, where in their Library of Congress, they're reading every damn page. You never know what you're going to find in there. And just to build on my own aside for a second, just on a lark. I myself went to Open Secrets to look at financial disclosures around George Santos when that whole situation came to light. And I'm like, oh, this is interesting. His cousin, Andrew Intrader, has this very bizarre giving pattern that starts and it's all to these Republicans, except for Tulsi Gabbard. What's the connection here? Russian oligarchs? What are her positions that she's spouting on Fox News? It's just, it's really interesting what comes to light when you start looking through records. Let me just... Yeah, and let me just oh, let please, me just please. There. the yeah. I mean, I remember the Robert Caro piece, which is it's great advice, and he's he's the master, of course. It's true. The, we spend so much time looking at things that are usually quite boring, like campaign finance records. But bringing it back to the Supreme Court again, none of that exists for the court. Even like really basic stuff that's usually boring, but but can mm. turn out to be incredibly important when you're trying to like piece together facts for a story. And I think part of the reason the court hasn't gotten the kind of coverage that member of Congress gets, for example, or the White House gets, is that these, these transparency laws requiring things like public records and public disclosure, like they really actually do matter. You can, you can dismiss them as a good government, boring, good government stuff. But that stuff really is the basis for journalists being able to do everyday the everyday reporting that should happen, I think, for any high public official, what what's going on with their financial lives? Is there anything that should be out there in the public domain for that people for people to look at and scrutinize? And it's very hard to do with the Supreme Court because it's it the place operates like a black box. Right. The reason you probably hear more financial scandals with members of Congress is that there are records. And so the barriers to discovering these things are much lower. And with the Supreme Court, as you laid out, they're incredibly high. And it involves these really detailed workarounds of the records that are available. Okay, take us inside. You and your colleagues are looking through these records. I'm picturing you. It's that scene. It's all the president's men. You're spiraling down. You're deep in like tax records and you're like rubbing your eyeballs. Was there a moment where you just, your eyes widened and you looked at something and you went, Oh shit. I can't believe what I like. Was it what was the most surprising thing you found in all these details you unearthed? Yeah, I think there was a couple of things. A after the first story, which was focused on the travel, Justice Thomas did release this statement, which is quite rare in and of itself. They, I think it would have been like over 10 years or something since he released a statement in response to a story. And the statement said it was dismissive and said, look, yes, we're we, Harlan and Kathy Crow are our close friends, are some of our closest friends, and we have taken family trips with them, and I didn't believe I had to disclose it. And and people, we put the reporting out there and people form their own opinions, obviously. Obviously, we thought it was noteworthy and worth absolutely valid to put this in the public domain to raise all kinds of questions. But people were saying, look, he has a rich friend, he travels with his friend. Soon after that, we heard about 
we got a tip about that Harlan Crow might have actually purchased real estate from Clarence Thomas. And so Josh and I went down to Savannah, Georgia, where Justice Thomas was the part owner of several properties, including this house that his mother lives in. And we went down to the Chatham County Courthouse where there's these property records. And sure enough, Harlan Crow, through, through a company, had purchased real estate from the Supreme Court justice who, he, they, who they say they describe themselves as friends, which I, that's a little bit more from a, than a normal friendship, I think. And, and then as we kept looking into these properties, we see that right after Crow bought Thomas's mother's house, there were permits pulled for tens of thousands of dollars of improvements. Like they added a carport and they replaced the roof and did a bunch of electrical work. And I think that was quite striking to us that this, the response to the first story was, okay, everyone has taken family trips with friends, but then suddenly we're talking about a real estate deal that again was undisclosed. Every expert we talked to said, there's no ambiguity in the disclosure statute. You have to disclose a real estate transaction, like a sale like this, if it's over a thousand dollars as well, if it's over a hundred thousand dollars for the whole deal. And parenthetically, CNN has reported, we have not confirmed this, that Justice Thomas plans to amend his forms on that real estate transaction. So that was, that really shifted our understanding of this relationship between Thomas and Crow. And then this tuition situation with this bankruptcy filing showing the tuition payment. I, I think a lot of people listening have had the experience of having to pay tuition for their kids, whether that's college or high school, if they're going to private school or junior high school. And that's a major financial burden for a family. And I do not think it is a normal situation, even between friends, to have your friend picking up a bill for $100,000 or so for your kid's private school tuition. That is not a normal friendship. I, or maybe I just don't have the right friends. I, I think all of this together, again, I mean, like the, the big picture for why we think this is important is you, Harlan Crow is not just a random individual. He is somebody that has been incredibly engaged in politics as a donor and as somebody, as, the, as a board member on the boards of quite influential think tanks that do work on the law and the court. So somebody that very influential and engaged in politics and has a, quote, friendship with a sitting Supreme Court justice in which there are large amounts of money flowing from this political donor to the justice and his family. So to us, this is clearly squarely in the public interest. This, this should be out there. So pe and people, again, can draw their, there's plenty of people who have dismissed this, but I think it can, it should be out there if, and for people to, to know about. Let me, let's put a finer point on what you were just saying. I think it's, I think it's, an, it's really critical because I've heard this, we do a round table show and my conservative colleague was like, oh, friends give gifts, friends go on trips. No, that's, first of all, that's, I also do not have the right friends in my life who are wealthy enough to take care of all of my expenses. If anyone out there is rich and would like to become my friend, I don't have any ethics problems. You can give me as much money as you like, please. But when you're a sitting Supreme Court justice, that is a problem, and it's especially a problem. And this is the core of the argument that Senator Sheldon Whitehouse was making both in the Senate hearing on this and on our show, our last guest, we're swimming in the slipstream here, um, that this is about you are ruling on cases where these friends, these people who are benefiting you, have interests in these cases. They have interests before the court. Now, you wrote in your most recent article just to quote back to you, Crow has long been an influential figure in pro-business conservative politics. He has given millions to efforts to move the law and the judiciary to the right and serves on the boards of think tanks that publish scholarship advancing conservative legal theories. Now, to be fair, it could be that he just holds those views. And it could be that his motivation in giving millions of dollars of benefits to Clarence Thomas, and we now know to the Thomas household through Ginny Thomas was genuine friendship. That is possible. It could have been a vain desire to rub shoulders with a Supreme Court justice because he wants to show off to his billionaire right-wing friends. That's also possible. I cannot dismiss those. But it is concerning 
as you just laid out, that his gifts to Clarence Thomas come in that larger context of he's not just a guy who happens to have some conservative views and happens to have some powerful friends. He is someone who is actively trying to move the judiciary, trying to move the jurisprudence of the Supreme Court. So my question to you is, and this kind of arises in the context of that famous painting of Harlan Crow and Leonard Leo and Clarence Thomas that you included right in your original story, all sitting together and like doing who knows what. Are there any instances of matters before the court where Thomas was ruling, where Crow was advocating or Crow was arranging to have Thomas meet with people who were advocating business before the court? No, it's a great question, and we don't know as much about the answer to that question as we would like to. We're still reporting on this, and parenthetically, if anyone has information about that or any others, anything else related to the Supreme Court, they should please get in touch. My contact information is at the bottom of all the stories. But yeah, there's a few things here. I mean, first of all, there we have not found an instance where Crow's company had a direct case of the Supreme Court, although that is not as significant as it sounds because the Supreme Court doesn't actually take that many cases every year. And there's not that many companies that are named litigants in cases. So there's cases that are hugely consequential for Harlan Crow related to the real estate industry in which Crow's company is not an actual named litigant. The Obamacare case, for example, it's not like every health insurance company was a named litigant in that, but obviously it was hugely consequential for them. So Crow has said that he does not seek to influence Thomas, but there, there is a pattern with a lot of the travel that we've been writing about where it's not just the Harlan Crow family and the Clarence Thomas family. It's the Crow family, the Thomas family, plus, you know, conservative legal activists like Leonard Leo in the painting, or in our recent story, actually, we reported on a, a new trip to the Baltics and Russia cruise on Harlan Crow's yacht in which it was the Crow family, the Thomas family, and the president of the American Enterprise Institute which is a think tank that is in, obviously involved in a whole range of issues, but they include advancing conservative legal theories. Sometimes their fellows actually file amicus briefs at the court. We do not have evidence at this point of Harlan Crow whispering in Justice Thomas's ear about a case or something. Obviously, it's very hard to get inside these rooms. Um, I think part of the reason it's healthy to have this stuff out in the public is people can ask those questions of Thomas and Crow, and we can try to find out more information on what is or isn't happening. But I think the larger point I would make, and this is not just about Clarence Thomas, is before I was writing about the Supreme Court, I had a kind of simplistic idea of justices thinking about them in a kind of binary way as either liberal or conservative or Democratic appointed or Republican appointed. And obviously, as I start to read about it and talk to people, that's really not the right way to think about it. And to give an example, even Justice Thomas, who is known as one of the more stubborn and independent-minded justices, he's always writing, even when he's voting with the majority, he often will write a concurrence saying, the majority didn't go far enough, or here's my particular view on it, um, his reputation. But it turns out there are actually examples of Justice Thomas totally changing his views on important legal issues during the time while he's been on the Supreme Court. To give one example, there's an important legal doctrine called Chevron, the Chevron Doctrine. And it relates to the kind of power of administrative agencies to interpret, interpret laws when it comes to regulation. And I'm no expert on the Chevron Doctrine, but it's incredibly important when it comes to the power of kind of executive branch agencies and the regulatory state. Justice Thomas wrote a decision back in 2005 called Brand X, uh, in which he, which was essentially su supporting this Chevron doctrine. Two years ago or three years ago in 2020, he wrote an opinion in which he said, I was wrong in Brand X. I'm completely changing my mind doing 180 degree on this issue, and we should overturn Chevron. So between 2005 and 2020, um, he changed his mind. And I don't think that happens by sitting in a room and staring at the, con at the text of the Constitution. Clearly, there's somebody, whether it's his clerks, something he's been reading, people he's been hanging out with, 
have gotten the, this new kind of view on the Chevron doctrine in front of him, and it convinced him. Um, I'm not saying there's even anything necessarily wrong with that. I'm just saying the appropriate way to view these justices is more like how you would view a member of Congress, which is they are influenceable and spending time with them, given the power that they wield and presenting potentially certain narratives to them or certain ideas to them is valuable. So that's how we're thinking about it. Obviously, trying to answer the actual question of how did just why did Justice Thomas change his view on Chevron? That's an empirical question, one that we're quite interested in. But I think that's the right way to think about these justices. This is why we have lobbying rules for Congress and the executive branch. And because And disclosure, you can look up Amazon spent $100,000 on lobbying Senator Schumer. You can look that up. And then that's the basis for more reporting. I've done a lot of that reporting myself. Absolutely. And it's a known proposition. Look, it's unfortunate that former Congressman Hodes, my former boss in Congress, is not with us because he could speak right now to the power of who you're in the room with and who's whispering in your ear. There are known members of Congress I have worked for and around many who, but just the scuttlebutt among staff, it's like, you want to know how they're going to vote? Figure out who was talking to them last before the vote. It matters who they're steeped in, marinating in, who's in their ear. That's why we have laws that let us all know those things. And as you said earlier, we do not for the Supreme Court. And it is super relevant. And I just want to underscore the importance of the Chevron case and that principle. This is something that the right uses as a cudgel in a kind of strict originalist way to undo the ability of the executive branch agencies to when we say regulate, it almost has a negative connotation to protect consumers, to protect Americans, to implement the intent of Congress, to do all the work that the EPA does and, uh, and FCC and FE, all these consumer protection related agencies. I'm also going to just expand on my own editorializing for a moment here to say that even though you have not yet established a one of those what we were looking for in the first Trump impeachment, like a an explicit quid pro quo, a, let's do crime together, please, and a paper trail that says that, because only the most fumbling, bumbling idiot would leave a paper trail like this, but maybe you'll find one. It's still the case that there are massive problems with the Thomas situation here. For one thing, in, in terms of cases before the court, where there were people with interests before the court, we know and we now know, as of today, we're recording this May 5th, we now not only know what Jane Mayer had previously established in her reporting in The New Yorker, that Liberty Consulting, run by Jimmy Tom Jenny Thomas, was receiving consulting payments from parties that were filing amicus briefs before the court. So these are people with matters before the court, with opinions to get before the court. These same parties are putting money into Clarence Thomas's household. So we not only know that. We also know that Leonard Leo, the head of the Federalist Society, was directing payments wheeled through Kellyanne Conaway, because you can't make these things up, into the Thomas household and trying to cover them up, trying to make them secret. And so that in itself is a problem. We do have a pattern here where you can't say directly that there was a litigant with a business interest, but there were certainly people trying to get their side heard by the court who were paying money into Clarence Thomas's household. That is a problem. And that also sets a larger context, and I swear this is going to lead to a question to you in just a moment. It also sets up the larger context. This is a point that Senator Whitehouse was making on the show before, that you don't need to have this explicit quid pro quo, like in the old timey railroad commissions, where the railroad people would give people a cushy job on the commission, and then lo and behold, they always ruled in favor of the railroads. Because there, you don't need to have a direct payment. Here's $50,000, rule this way in this case. You can just be marinating in a lifestyle of benefits and luxury that could be taken away at any time where there's a very much implied, we want you, we're friends, we want you to continue doing what we want. And so if you are the Thomas household, benefiting from this lavish lifestyle supplied to you by Harlan Crow, who's also buying your mother's house, giving her rent-free tenancy, and also paying for your adoptive son to go to a fancy private school, and all of these bells and whistles that make your entire lifestyle, if that's all provided by this billionaire, and you're thinking to yourself, huh, I wonder how I should rule in this case. And you happen to know that this friend of yours has some pretty strong views. It's just likely going to enter your mind. That 
is a problem because this one person and his wealthy friends should not exert undue influence on the people who exert the most individual power in our country, except for the president of the United States. Okay. I said that this would all lead to a question, and I'm going to make good on that. You wrote, uh, this was a wonderfully written sentence. I want to kudos to you as a writer, to your editor, and to your team. This was in your most recent article yesterday on the tuition payments. Thomas did not report the tuition payments from Crow on his annual financial disclosures. Several years earlier, Thomas disclosed a gift of $5,000 for Martin's education from another friend. Here's the line that absolutely had me in stitches as a writer. It is not clear why he reported that payment, but not Crow's. Just wonderfully trim. Fantastic. That leads to a larger question here of, it is not clear why, in some instances, he showed an understanding of the ethics and disclosure rules. And yet his larger defense here is, it's the Bill Belichick defense, I misinterpreted the rules. I was unaware that these rules applied to me, which is particularly rich coming from a strict originalist. What do you make of that larger defense in the case of the tuition and in the larger pattern of gifts here, given that sometimes he was following the rules and sometimes he sees, he claims to be totally unaware of them? Yeah, it's a great question. In this tuition case, as you mentioned, there was earlier back, way back in 2002, Justice Thomas got this $5,000 gift from like a different friend, a much less interesting friend, like a guy from the RV community down in Florida. He's a big RV guy. Clarence yeah, Thomas. Justice Thomas is a big RV guy. And it, you can pull his disclosure filing and there it is in the section, the gift section. And it says $5,000 from, from this guy. And it's labeled as educa education gift to Mark Martin. And that's the grandnephew that he was raising as a son. So then you fast forward not that many years, 2006 is when the first Crow tuition payments started, which were far larger than 5,000. Again, we believe it was now around $100,000 in total. And it seems to be the same or at, the, or at least analogous. This is for the education of Mark Martin. and Th those are not disclosed as gifts. And we genuinely don't know, in part because Justice Thomas hasn't been responding to our questions on this latest story, why there was that apparently striking divergence. As I mentioned earlier, we did get a statement after the story was published from Mark Pauletta, who is a longtime and close friend of the Thomas family. He was also Ginny Thomas's lawyer on the January 6th stuff. He put out a statement saying First of all, acknowledging and confirming that the tuition payments happened, but also saying that Thomas didn't have to disclose them. But that statement did not address this earlier disclosure. It just, it just ignored it. And also, it's a little strange for us to be using these statements from Mark Pauletta because he's he's not Justice Thomas's official spokesman. He's just he's a longtime friend. He's close to the family. But we have not heard an actual argument made by Justice Thomas himself, by the by a Supreme Court spokesperson about this. We, they just haven't addressed it. And so, yeah, right, right now it's a mystery. And it goes to a larger issue with all this, which is these ethics filings, which are these disclosure filings, which are one of the few things that you get from the Supreme Court when it comes to public records. In the rest of the federal government, you may have experienced this yourself, there's a whole infrastructure of ethics lawyers in Congress, there's ethics committee in the, in the executive branch. There's every federal agency has a whole like office of ethics lawyers that receive these forms, read them, kind of adjudicate issues related to the forms, enforce the rules. If you if you if you miss stuff or file false forms, when it comes to Supreme Court, we have absolutely no idea what happens, if anything. When the justices fill out these forms, does anyone look at them? Are is there any kind of back and forth? Is there any is there anyone over there who is trying to enforce the rules? Again, it goes back to this issue of it's a total black box, and this goes for again. This is not just about Justice Thomas; it's about all the justices, and so that's something we're very interested in trying to understand more. I can understand why, and I just for me the moment of it reminds me of the movie The Fugitive, where the guard after the train 
crashes. The guard is, I was a hero here. I ripped, I got Richard Kimball out of the wreckage. I'm so brave. And then it's like, they, they find that the handcuffs are gone. And Tommy Lee Jones says, do you want to change your bullshit story here? And after <laughs> Clarence Thomas says, oh, I was unaware. I was mysteriously advised by someone. Yeah. You don't have to worry about any of this stuff. I could almost see myself saying, man, you went ahead and disclosed this exact same thing from someone else. Do you want to change your bullshit story here? I know you've got to get out of here because you have to keep doing this work, which is really important to America. Two more quick ones for you. First, in talking to Senator Whitehouse the other day, we were talking about what the Senate can do. And we've, in this conversation, covered the difficulties that you face in just trying to dig through records and get to the bottom of what you can based on what's available. Are there things that a Senate investigation could find with their subpoena power that you can't? Do, do we need a congressional investigation here to keep going down this road? Yeah, I guess what I'd say is certainly there's things that a Senate investigation could find that we can with subpoena power. One question is, are there other gifts from Harlan Crow to Justice Thomas that we don't know about? And we can try to get at that through through reporting, but obviously we don't have the power to subpoena Harlan Crow's <laughs> bank or something like that. There's, there's absolutely all kinds of things the Senate investigation could get at that would be incredibly interesting. Also, issues: who else were on these trips? Were they people with various with business before the court, or in, in or interest more broadly interest related to the court? I think there's also, there's been some reporting since our first stories about other justices. Justice Gorsuch, there was a story about Justice Sotomayor and her book deal, which did not at all rise to the level of what we've been writing about with Justice Thomas. But I actually think of that in general is healthy to have this stuff out there and people can, we should all be making judgments about what we think is actually scandalous or problematic and what's not. But Again, we're reporting on the entire Supreme Court. I keep getting emails saying, why aren't you writing about the Democratic appointed justices? And the honest answer to that is I've only, we've only been at this for four months. And there's only so many hours in the day. But if somebody out there knows about George Soros giving money to Justice Kagan and her family, please get in touch because we absolutely will write that. I think there's a lot the Senate could do here if there's political will to do it. There's been some, I think there's some caution around separation of powers issues around like actually trying to get justices to to testify, but there's all kinds of things that would not involve actually getting documents from the Supreme Court, for example, getting records from Harlan Crow. Let me get you out on this. I'm not nearly, I'm certainly not a reporter and I'm not nearly the writer that you are, but I've certainly gone through the editing process where Words that are near and dear to me, work that I put in to unearth information, ends up on the cutting room floor. It's just, it just happens in the course of writing. Is there anything that hasn't made it into any of your stories that's on the cutting room floor that, hey, you might as well give it some life here that you think is interesting or stood out to you, or you just wish it's, hey, editor, I agree with you, but I'd love to get this little nugget back. There, there probably is, but my editors would yell at me if I said it publicly. But I guess what I would say is stay tuned because we are definitely still reporting on all of this and the Supreme Court more generally. Check. If you keep following our work, there will be more. We will do that. We will keep following your work. We will, we will absolutely ask you to come back during the next set of revelations, which I just have this funny feeling are coming. I, there's so much smoke. I'll bet that there's a raging fire going on here. And let's just... To close out, please give your contact information again, because look, what you've demonstrated here is that the truth is out there. I sound like the X-Files. The truth is out there. There are people who know things. You are uncovering this vital information through old-fashioned reporting. You're talking to people who have little pieces of the puzzle, and you're putting it together. There are more pieces out there. So how can people get in touch with you with information? No, absolutely. And yeah, a lot of this reporting or pretty much all of this reporting just would not have happened unless w without a lot of people being willing to talk to us in many cases anonymously, in some cases, people who potentially were in positions of risk and had things to lose. And that's incredibly important. And we want to honor that. We, my my email address, justin at propublica.org. I'm on Signal, WhatsApp. You can get my phone number. It's on my Twitter bio. My Twitter is 
first name, last name, Justin Elliott, Elliott with two L's and two T's. And yeah, if anyone has any ideas again about any justices or anything that they think we should know about Supreme Court, that's really the only way this stuff happens. Absolutely. Amen to that. Justin Elliott, thank you again, not just for being with us, but for all of the critical work you're doing. And uh, we really appreciate it. Thanks so much.